I just couldn't believe that I had gone in for a biopsy and it had turned into this. I was angry. I don't think they realized how serious it was. It looked like my flesh was being eaten away from the inside out. She stopped moving. She stopped breathing. I thought she was just going to die. Next, two medical mysteries that defy the experts. When June Pesci goes in for a routine breast exam, little does she realize that in less than 72 hours, she'll be in a desperate fight for her life. I woke up and was missing three quarters of my left breast. I could feel my body dying. Then, 10-week-old Brianna Heading seems like a healthy baby in every way, until her parents experience what can only be described as the shock of their lives. Her eyes started to bounce in the back of her head, and she was hard as a rock. I knew something was not right. In Iraq, I've been shot at. It doesn't even come close to as scared as I was. In the fall of 1999, 36-year-old June Hook had just started working at a local printing plant in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, when she met a man who captured her heart, Kirk Pesci. I was running a printing press, and she was a customer service rep at the company we both worked for. She had a great personality. I loved her smile, and I just thought she was beautiful. He'd flirt with me every morning when I was going into work. And then he just started bringing me in coffee, and the relationship blossomed from there. I was comfortable with her, she was comfortable with me. It felt like we've known each other a lot longer than we actually had. He was funny, he made me laugh, and we liked doing the same things. And within two years, June and Kirk were exchanging wedding vows before a small group of family and friends. It was in our yard at our house, and we just had a huge party afterwards. Over the years, the couple shared an unbreakable bond. We just loved spending time together. We had a good time. Kayaking, fishing, all different kinds of outdoor stuff. June's active lifestyle keeps her fit and healthy. So in April of 2009, when she goes in for her annual mammogram, she fully expects to receive a clean bill of health. I really haven't ever had any problems in the past, so I just figured it was going to be a routine visit. But the results are anything but routine. A mammogram found two small masses on my left breast. There was a small anxiety that there could be some cancer. I was scared and nervous. I've seen several people in my life, you know, die of cancer. The doctors decided that they wanted me to go in for a stereotactic biopsy where they go in with a needle and extract the specimens and they leave behind a small titanium chip so that during future mammograms they'll be able to tell where specimens were taken from previously. They sent out the tissue for testing and told me that I should hear back from them within days. My biopsy results came back negative. I was very happy to hear that. But her relief is short-lived. When June wakes up Monday morning, she's alarmed to see a disturbing change in her breast. I noticed that there was a painful portion of my left breast, and there was a small lump. It was red and hard to the touch. It was extremely painful. I had a hard time reaching up to the top of the cabinets in the kitchen. And it almost had a tingling sensation like any infection normally has. Lifting things was very painful. Simple things like carrying laundry hurt. It was very frustrating. My husband suggested that I get in to see the doctor. The doctor looked at it and said it was warm to the touch and took specimens from that so she could send out cultures on it. She gave me 
a prescription for pain medication, and an antibiotic. Despite the week-long course of treatment, the redness and inflammation seem to spread. And even more troubling, pus begins oozing out from June's breast. It looked like an infection that needed to be cleaned out. At that point, the mark was probably a half an inch to an inch across. Each day, she seemed to be in more pain than she was the day before. At this point, I was just baffled that she wasn't getting any better after almost a week of antibiotics. I wasn't feeling well, and so I took my temperature, and I found that I had a fever of 100. I was concerned when I realized that I had a fever. She just felt more run down. She looked very sick. I was trying the hot compresses and the cold compresses to relieve some of the pressure. Nothing helped. The redness spread some, and it got a little harder. It just looked like a big zit or a boil was building under skin. The opening in the lump had gotten bigger. It was much more painful. And it was strange because the painful area was actually a lot bigger than the lump itself. I put bandages over the top of it. The drainage would just seep right through the bandages, so I had to change them several times a day. On the 5th of May, the bump was probably an inch and a half across. Horrified, June schedules an emergency appointment that afternoon. The breast specialist thought that the infection may have been caused by the titanium chip that they had put in my breast. The doctor took me in for surgery and cut out the titanium chip. The procedure goes smoothly, and June breathes a sigh of relief. It seemed reasonable that the titanium chip would have caused the infection. I thought that was going to be the cure-all to what was going wrong with June. But nothing could have prepared her for what she sees while she's changing her bandage that night. It looked like my flesh was being eaten away from the inside out. It looked awful to me, just horrible. It was a three-inch gash in her chest. It looked like the flesh was dissolving and there was pus all around the edges. It was just very, very wrong. That night was very difficult for me. I had a hard time sleeping that night. I had an open wound on my chest. The pain medication that they gave me really wasn't doing anything. It was extremely painful. The wound had gotten a lot worse just in that 24-hour period. I went back to see the doctor and she immediately had me admitted to the hospital. They took more blood, they took more cultures from the wound, and informed me that they couldn't figure out what was wrong. Over the next five days, June watches in horror as her painful wound spreads out of control. The pain was horrific. It didn't feel like anything else I had ever experienced, especially when they'd come in to change the bandages. It felt like they were ripping my flesh off. I was angry. I don't think they realized how serious it was. I just remember them talking and arguing with each other, but no one really having an answer. I honestly thought they had no clue. It was like being trapped in a nightmare. After undergoing a biopsy, June Pesci has developed a mysterious festering wound that's ravaging her breast. It seems to be immune to antibiotics, and even more baffling to her doctors, not a single test has turned up anything even remotely out of the ordinary. It was very difficult. I was stressed every day. I didn't know what was going on. My worst fear was that she was going to die. I honestly believe if I hadn't asked them to be transferred that they would have let me sit there until I died. She said I'd like to go somewhere that can save me, or at least help me. And at that point, I requested to be transferred down to Brigham and Women's in Boston. 45 minutes later, 
on-call trauma surgeon Dr. Amy Rizak takes over June's case and is stunned by what she sees. Her left breast was all dead skin. On the upper, inner and outer quadrants, it had bluish and black discoloration. And in addition to that, there was some gray uh, drainage from the small um, opening in her left breast. I was concerned for necrotizing fasciitis, um, also known as a flesh-eating bacteria. Necrotizing fasciitis, or flesh-eating disease, is an extremely rare antibiotic-resistant infection that destroys skin, fat, and tissue. It spreads rapidly, and if not stopped, can be deadly. It was very scary to hear those words. June went in for a simple breast biopsy and she came out with possibly a flesh-eating bacteria. Alarmed by the severity of June's condition, Dr. Rizak schedules emergency surgery at 2 a.m. It was extremely important to act quickly and take her to the operating room. I was scared that she was going into surgery, but I was happy that they knew what was going on. By removing the dead tissue, we would stop the infection from spreading and to allow um, any viable tissue to remain viable and not become infected. If we did not uh, do anything urgently, the disease would have progressed rapidly and the patient would have died. It seemed like seconds were, were hours. It was uh, horrible to, just to sit in the waiting room and just to wait for her to come out of surgery to make sure she was okay. The entire upper portion of uh, June's breast was removed. It was all necrotic tissue. Groggy from painkillers, June doesn't know just how much of her breast she's lost. It's a total blur. I was in and out of consciousness. When I was conscious, the things that I remember are when I was having the bandage changes. Where they had done the surgery was excruciatingly painful, even on the morphine. The next 12 hours are critical. If the operation has been successful, June's skin should begin to heal. At that point, I felt that we were able to get most of the infection out of June's breast and give her immune system a, a little bit of a chance to catch up. But soon after the surgery, as Dr. Rizak is checking on June, she's completely taken aback by a frightening new development. I was shocked to see how much the redness and the necrosis had spread along her chest wall and down to the lower portion of her left breast. Clearly, the surgery hasn't stopped the terrifying disease. And within the hour, there's another unmistakable sign that the infection is once again out of control. Her white blood cell count was going up and she was having high fevers almost continuously. White blood cells are essential players in the body's immune system. When infection or trauma occurs, the body sends these cells to the affected area to help heal and repair the tissue. But in large numbers, they can cause dangerous inflammation. The body's inflammatory system just goes into overdrive, blood pressure gets low, and the patient basically just spirals from there. She really still wasn't feeling correct. She still didn't feel right. Uh, she was still ill. I knew something was terribly wrong. I remember my mother coming in and rubbing my feet for me because they hurt. I don't remember the doctors having any conversations with me at all. They told me everything that they were doing and everything that they were going to do. I just don't remember any of it. I was worried to death about her. Um, I thought she was okay, and she just wasn't. We had preliminary data that showed um, there were no growth in the cultures that we took in the operating room or in the emergency department from her uh, blood. I was concerned, but I wasn't 100% concerned that the cultures were preliminary negative because it's not uncommon for you know no bacteria to grow after someone's been on IV antibiotics for several days. I, at that point, really thought I was dying. I could feel my body just 